Hi guys, today's video is another review slash recommendation of a book that I read and loved recently. And I wish I could call this snowy day reads and recs by now, but we haven't had any snow yet. It's been quite cold, unusually cold actually for December for where I live, but there's been no snow. There's It's been quite sunny, which I'm not complaining about, but a little bit of snow would be nice as well, but oh well. Anyhow, the book that I'm going to talk about today is a fantasy novella by Tenneth Lee and I spent one of Lauren's cozy reading nights from Lauren and the Books spent it just reading this book and it was perfect. Just the perfect short read for a lazy autumn slash winter night. Now, Tenneth Lee is quite a big name in fantasy but I had never heard of her until two or three months ago even though I've been reading fantasy for nearly two decades now. But I guess her heyday ended quite some time before I started reading fantasy. She wrote and published nearly a hundred novels, I think, but there are no really big epic fantasy series among her oeuvre. And most of what she wrote was a little bit edgy, a little bit weird and unconventional, at least for the time when the books were published. And I think that for my introduction to Tenneth Lee, I inadvertently picked the one book of hers that is least unconventional, least weird and least edgy, or at least it's one of her tamer books. Um, but I picked it because of its title, The Winter Players, which sounded so nicely seasonal. And as you know, I am uncharacteristically seasonal in my reading this year. This novella has a very traditional high fantasy setting. It starts in a tiny, sleepy seaside village in a pre-industrial world with what seems like traditional trades and crafts and gender roles. It's all not very detailed and defined. This is a very short book after all. But for this kind of setting it doesn't really need very many words. It's a traditional high fantasy setting and we all know what that looks like, don't we? So our protagonist, Wave, is a young teenage girl who is the single priestess in the shrine that is associated with the village. And there she prays and performs the daily rituals and keeps and guards three holy relics, a ring, a jewel and a piece of bone. Knowledge of the origin and the meaning and the possible function of these three relics is lost in time and no one but the priestess even knows what the relics are, not even the villagers. And that is why Wave is more than a little surprised and apprehensive when a mysterious grey-haired, grey-eyed stranger arrives at the temple and asks her for the relics, for the piece of bone specifically. She denies him, of course, but he comes again in the night and steals the relic. And what little magic Wave has is completely ineffective against him. And because the relics are at the center of Wave's cult and her function as a priestess and therefore at the center of Wave's life, she has no choice but to go after the stranger and try and retrieve the bone from him. However far it takes her, wherever it takes her, however hard it will be for her and whatever is waiting for her at the end of the journey and whatever the reason was for the stranger to steal her relic. So this is a classic quest story. There is a journey, there's adventure, there's magic, there's fighting with and without magic and there is a curse at the end. And most importantly there is lots and lots of cold weather and winter and snow and all the things that you would expect to find in an enchanted snowy winter wood. 
The story also has a remarkable protagonist. Oave is such a young girl and she sets out into the unknown without ever having set foot outside her tiny fishing village ever before in her life. And she does so without ever second guessing herself or her abilities for even just one second. She has this remarkable faith. This is just, she's a priestess, that's what she does having faith and she has this deep conviction that this is a task that she has to do and that she has to accomplish and that therefore she will accomplish. It's, it's never said in, in so many words but you can tell from the way that she takes everything in her stride, not without having difficulties, but without ever letting that get her down. Just from the way she behaves, you can tell that she has this huge well of faith and conviction inside herself that allows her to do all these things without breaking down with anxiety and from being so overwhelmed by everything and, and by this responsibility on her shoulders. But the best thing about the novella and the reason why I'm recommending it, even though it is such a traditional kind of story and it's, it's a quite old one too, it was published in 1976, I think, but what sets it apart from a lot of other high fantasy quest stories of this kind is the writing style. The writing is extremely poetic and lyrical and it felt, reading it felt like I was dreaming it. I think one of the reasons for that is that we don't actually get a lot of insight into Wave's thoughts and feelings. We get told mostly what she does, not so much what she thinks. And this would usually create a bit of a distance between the reader and the, and the story. But since the story is so plot driven, it is so immersive that you don't feel outside of it. However, it, it does have, it, it feels a bit intangible and this is kind of what I mean by dreamlike. It's like you are floating along with a story but you are not so much inside the character. And this is what made this a really remarkable reading experience for me, even though plot-wise it is really nothing groundbreaking, especially from a contemporary point of view. There is one thing though that very nearly destroyed it all for me but thankfully it happens at the very end after we are past the main crisis point. Something happens then that I'm sure will not sit well with anybody who has read or watched a lot of SFF before. Maybe people were more forgiving in the 70s or maybe they didn't really pick up on it back then, but today it, it really is a no-go. And this element, this plot twist, right unnecessarily right at the end of the book, is why this book isn't going to appear on any of my best of the year or favorite reads of the year list. Up until that point, however, it, it was it was just absolutely lovely. It was fascinating, captivating and all around a joy to read and I don't mention this to put you off picking it up. Um, I just I'd like to put it out there that I have noticed this and I disagree with it and if you've read this novella I'd love to talk to you about it. And I'd also like to know if you've read anything else by Tenneth Lee that you'd recommend. I found two of her titles used. I found Black Unicorn, which I think is a YA novel or novella, um, which apparently won the World Fantasy Award. And I have The Silver Metal Lover, which 
is about a girl or a young woman who falls in love with an AI or maybe it's called a robot, <laughs> I'm not sure. This is um, quite an old book as well, it's from 1981. Um, and this is about an AI slash robot, but it apparently, well, it, it looks like it has a classic fantasy setting. So I'm very curious about this one. But if you are new to Tennis Lee as well, I'd say that the winter players would make a good introduction, even though it is uncharacteristically conventional for Tennis Lee's work. But I'm sure that it will make you curious about the rest of her work. And that's a good thing for an introduction to do, isn't it? So that's it for today. I have some longer videos in the making where I'm going to talk about a larger number of books. And then it's almost time for the best of 2020 lists as well. So videos of a bit more substance are coming up on this channel. Until then, I hope you're doing well or as well as anyone can do these days. See you soon. Bye.